good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore with another of our virtual events. And uh, we're here with two uh, wonderful writers who have fantastic new books out. Uh, first is Jillian Cantor, um, who has a new book out called Half-Life, right? I have a cop, the paperback copy right here. And she signed a batch of the hardcovers, which should be arriving any moment here at the bookstore. Um, and then we have Nula O'Connor, who has a brand new book out called Nora, um, about Nora Barnacle, uh, James Joyce's uh, wife. Uh, absolutely fantastic book. And both of these are really, you know, as I said, I, I uh, had the honor of, um, of, of doing this event kind of at the last minute. And I'm so pleased that I get to do it because uh, both of these books uh, were such amazing, engaging and original works. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing you talk about them. And I understand you'll be chatting back and forth a little bit, but uh, uh, there, there are quite a, a few through lines between both of your books I found, uh, maybe in unanticipated ways. You know, both books deal with the, uh, the complexities and, uh, and the sacrifices that come with, uh, with genius, you know, with love, with art, you know, with social status. Uh, there's a lot going on in these books. And uh, so I'll be largely uh, lurking in the background, at least for the first part of this, but I think I'm gonna pop up and ask you both some questions. Um, and for those of you watching on Facebook, uh, I'll be monitoring the comments uh, as they come in. So please uh, send your questions in, in the comments field, and I'll be happy to, to ask them. So I'm gonna turn it over to the two of you for the moment. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, I'm going to talk to Gillian first because Gillian's book is fresh off the press. It was published on Tuesday by Harper Perennial. Congratulations, Gillian. Thank you. Um, and it Half-Life is about Polish French scientist Marie Curie. And it's the, Gillian, you've used this dual, this parallel structure where we have Marie's life in Paris, the life we may know a little about. But then we have her alternate self, Maria, who is stayed behind in Poland, essentially. Um, and it's a novel about being at a crossroads. It's about the crush of the patriarchy. It's about committing to the project of life. But I'd love to know, as a writer, I'm always fascinated with structure. So could you talk to me about maybe the first spark of Half-Life? Uh, you have a lovely story about a man and a statue and how the novel grew from that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. And thank you for having us, Patrick. Um, I think uh, a few years ago, I got to launch in person at Poison Pen. So it's lovely that we can all still connect even in this crazy time. Um, so yeah, so Half-Life, I've been describing it as sort of Marie Curie meets sliding doors because you get to see the real Marie Curie's life and story. But side by side is also the story of Maria, who I imagine could have been the woman she became if she she had made one different choice uh, in her early 20s. And when I first got the idea to write a novel about Marie Curie, I actually thought that I was going to write sort of a straight biographical fiction novel, uh, much like your novel, um, Nola. So I wanna ask you about that. But I think I wrote about 50 pages um, and I sent it to my agent and she said something along the lines of, you know, this is fine, but it doesn't really feel like a book you would write. <laughs> and I realized she was right. I tend to sort of gravitate towards the, like the what if story. I have another novel about Anne Frank's sister, Margot, and what if she had lived and, and had seen what had happened with her sister's fame. And um, I, I always sort of fall in that space. So I thought about it a little bit. I decided I was gonna start over again. And I started writing a novel about Marie's oldest daughter, Eve, who I was really drawn to because she became a writer. And I think I had about 75 pages of that version. Um, that was also called Half-Life. It was always called Half-Life. <laughs> um, and it still wasn't feeling right to me. And I kept thinking about this one thing that I had read about Marie. And that was that she was engaged as a young woman in Poland. Um, 
And then the man's mother made him break it off because he said that she wasn't good enough for him, which like, imagine that she's a future Marie Curie. I know, you know, it was a social class thing at the time, but I just couldn't get that out of my head. That and the fact that I read later in life, and this is what you asked me about with the statue. Um, after she died, there was a statue erected of her in front of her institute in Poland. And I read that he used to go sit there every day and eat his lunch and stare at the statue. And so I kept thinking, I have to find a way to get this into the story. And finally, I realized, wait a minute, this is the story. Um, what if she had married him? And that's when I started over for the third time. Um, and, it's, and it's the half-life that it became today. So I decided to do Maria's uh, life if she had married this man and you get to sort of see from when she's in her 20s until when she died and then Marie's life um, moving to Paris going to Sorbonne meeting Pierre and discovering radium and so I, I got that what if angle into the book that uh, I sort of always get um, and I think like in that vein Nola I'm really interested in how you wrote, wrote Nora because Nora is a, a sort of straight biographical historical fiction of Nora Barnacle's life. And what I loved about your book is that I felt that it was paced so well. I was like turning the pages and, and very riveted by this very real story. And that's what I think I was struggling with as a writer trying to, um, to write Marie's story, just the straight biographical way. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you, how you did that. Yeah, I guess that's the trouble with biographical fiction in a way, isn't it? That a life is not a story. Like we don't have story like stories to our lives. We have, you know, troubles and all fiction is about people who are, are in flux essentially and going through difficult times. And the novelist looks at how that they manage those things and how they solve these things for good or for bad. And so I'm presented with a life, two lives, because James Joyce looms large also. Yeah. And I have to make something story-like out of it. Um, I suppose the idea came to me because I was studying Italian by night and I had to write an essay about Joyce, but I was all the time squinting over his shoulder to see what is Nora doing over there. I'm much more interested in her. Uh, I had read Brenda Maddox's biography of Nora in my late teens. So I dug that out and started reading it again. and. I did what I often do when my interest is peaked. I wrote something short first. So my Emily Dickinson novel grew out of a poem I wrote about Emily. Uh, and this one grew out of a short story. So I wrote a short story about Joyce and Nora's fateful meeting in June 1904. And I took them as far as five months later when they uh, eloped together. And then the story did well. It was published in Granta and it won a prize. But I, I just couldn't leave Nora behind. I, I, my communion with her was not over. And so I just wrote on and on and on. And then of course the research becomes a much larger project. And an, for me, an incredibly enjoyable project. Though Hilary Mantel says that novelists shouldn't call themselves researchers because we're not really interested in facts. <laughs> we're interested in information more so, you know. Um, and we're interested in questioning the facts. You know, it's like when you yeah. when you saw Cassie Mertz sitting there forlornly, to my mind, eating his lunch, looking at the statue and whatever, um, you started asking yourself questions and I'm the same. I, I, I just, I look at what's on the record and I start to poke at it because, you know, research for us has already been filtered, right? It's from history right. books, it's from biographies, and we have to look and, and, and think to ourselves, okay, what filter has been put here and do I agree or do I not agree? And where am I going to bring this, you know? And, and what am I gonna say about the interiority of these people? Because we're more about the feelings than the facts, I think, as biofiction writers. Yeah, you know, I agree with that. And, and I think that's what initially drew me to uh, Marie's story. You know, I, I always knew that she had discovered radium and she won a Nobel Prize and sort of knew these large facts about her. But I had initially, um, I read a piece about her personal life and that's what sort of drew me in thinking about, uh, you know, she actually, she had a lot of tragedy in her personal life and a lot of struggle that she had to overcome to be able to achieve these things. And when I started sort of thought about her everyday life and what it was like for her as a woman and a mother and a wife. Um, that's what I got interested in, in writing about and imagining, I think. Yeah, it's like when you start to do the digging, 
that I find anyway, because and I usually write about women, the women become 20 times more interesting to me than they ever were. Yeah. And it's almost like falling in love. And, you know, I I live in a place where I don't know a lot of people. So my husband has to be my sounding board. He has to listen to me get <laughs> excited about these characters. I'm sure you brought Marie Curie to many a dinner in your yeah, home. My whole my whole family had to listen. <laughs> my kids too. Yeah, I have three kids as well. Um, and so you start getting mad excited and bringing all this info, you know, to your sounding board and yeah. saying, oh, you won't believe this. I found this piece of information. And then I think it's that excitement that then propels you forward. And then, of course, you have to find a structure. So I'm really interested in your structure. I've written a, a novel before that was a dual narrative and it's, you know, it's such an enjoyable thing to do because you almost give yourself a break when you you switch from one voice yeah. to the other voice. So I'm just wondering why, in a sense, the dual narrative felt crucial to your process. And you've already touched on the fact that you, yeah. this is like a thing that you do. You, you, you look at the untold part. Yeah, I mean, in this this story, especially, you know, I felt like it had to be told this way. If I was going to examine these two women's lives side by side, then I felt that they truly had to be side by side. So you would see what they were each doing in each year. And one of the the best things about writing this and also definitely the most challenging was the fact that both storylines have all the same characters, but they're slightly different people depending on this one choice that she makes. So I had to sort of keep track of who everyone was and in which storyline they were because, you know, Pierre plays a big part in both, but he's not the same Pierre Curie in the storyline where he doesn't marry Marie. Um, so it was sort of like keeping track of that. And, you know, as I was planning out the first draft, I made a big timeline, which I don't, I don't normally outline. I keep, I keep saying I outlined this book, but I guess it wasn't really an outline. It was a timeline. Usually that's not the way I write, but in this case, because I had the structure that way, where it was the two women side by side, I made a big timeline of every single year that was going to be a chapter in the book and what each woman would be doing and where they would be living and which characters would be in that chapter. Um, and I, I just, I guess I felt like it was the only way to tell the story because of the sort of sliding doors element. Um, and so you could sort of immediately see side by side how things were different, how things were the same. And I do, I do agree with you. I love the dual narrative because I would, I would write a chapter and then I would get to switch and it felt, it felt like a little break and a little breath of fresh air. Yeah. I have a quick question, if you don't mind, if I just jump in real quick. Yeah. And I love I love the device that you use to kind of set the story going. You know, it it begins in uh, uh, was it 1934? Is that right? Or when she's at the at the end of her life, and you know, we learn yeah. that both both you know the narrative that the dual narrative part is is a projection of her own mind. You know, it's inside right. of her, and I found that really fascinating too. More of a comment yeah. than a question, but yeah, no, it does. It the the book starts and ends when Marie dies. I don't think that's a, a spoiler because it's about her life, um, but it's you know it sort of starts as she's on her deathbed and it's her sort of questioning her life choices and that's that's sort of the starting point for this split to see you know if she had made this one different choice how would things have been different um, and then it 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 comes back to that same scene in the end. Right. What, what Nula was saying interest, uh, really interested me that, you know, our lives are, you know, biographies, I'm paraphrasing, they're not stories, you know, they're not, uh, you know, these things that occur in our lives that are, you know, may seem accidental or occasional, you know, turn out to be the main plot points in this little structure that we create. Uh, it's fascinating. And I, who's that? Uh, who's that kitty up there? Yeah, that's my cat. My my son's actually on the other side of the computer. He's supposed to be the animal wrangler, but the cat has escaped him. So he, he's done with us now. He's gone. <laughs> yeah. What? I Go love on. this. Um, the idea of choice is is huge in your novel, Jillian. Yeah. And 
in every novel we write, it's about choice. So we choose where to shine our torch in a sense, what part of the life. So, yeah. you know, for example, Nora Barnacle traditionally has been quite <laughs> smudged and, and sort of a little, you know, ink blot on Joyce's pages. Even when Brenda Maddox went to write her, her um, biography of Nora, Richard Allman, no uh, Joyce's biographer, told her that her, there, there's not enough, you know, well, she ended up writing a 550 page biography of Nora. So clearly there was enough, but there's always this feeling that these women are not personally important just because they weren't, you know, a famous genius. Obviously I'm talking about Nora here, not yeah. about Marie Curie, but um, our business then is to, out of these choices, make what Virginia Woolf calls moments of being, you know, believable scenes, you know, emotionality, like the reasons why they made choices. So why did Marie Curie get on the train from Poland that first time? And then in the Maria section, why she didn't get on that train? And I thought you did it brilliantly. And I love that Cathy Mertz is there at the start in that prologue that is actually the end. It's a beautiful book ending of the novel and was very moving. And I think it sets you up nicely for understanding Mary. She's, she's not a paragon of virtue. She's a brittle woman. She's work obsessed, perhaps to the neglect of her daughters. Um, do you want to talk a little about the two personalities and your choices around their personalities? So Marie is the scientist and Maria is more motherly and more, well, she's a frustrated mother too. Yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, one thing I think I was really conscious of as I was writing was thinking about the fact that, you know, sort of no matter what choices we make, no life is all good or all bad. There's, there's some balance in there. And so I really thought about the fact that just because maybe Maria wouldn't have this big life like Marie had, maybe she could still have a good life. And, and what did that entail? Um, and, you know, and I also read a, a lot about Marie and sort of like what her regrets were later in life. And I, I thought a lot about that. You know, she did experience a lot of tragedy in her life and, and she was depressed, very depressed at points. Um, and she struggled with her relationship especially with her younger daughter who was not interested in science at all, much to her chagrin. She got along very well with her older daughter who was interested in science. And, uh, you know, I sort of thought about, well, if she had made these different choices, would she have a different relationship with her child? Would she have a, a different relationship with science? Would she have, a, you know, um, also Marie was very like struggled with her fame. She really had issues with, with the way the press covered her and, and the press sort of hounded her too. And, thinking about the fact, you know, would a quiet life in a lot of ways be a better life? Um, so I was definitely very conscious as I, as I was writing those two storylines. What I also felt was that they were, they were the same person, you know, they, they ended up being different because these, these choices, but they were very much the same person. I felt that even though Maria didn't go to Paris and wasn't educated at the Sorbonne, she would still want to educate herself and she would still, you know, be drawn to science. And so I really made sure I found a way for her to do that, uh, even though she didn't have the opportunities that Marie had moving to France and having the education and having the resources. Um, so I, I felt it was, it was a really interesting exercise as a writer to be writing about what I felt was the same person, but they were actually different characters, especially as more time went on. I don't know about you, Nula, but I was really fascinated with the whole flying university, mm. uh, you know, the yeah. underground uh, education. Kind of yeah, so the real... Yeah, the real Marie and her sister, when they were young women in Poland, they attended what was called um, a flying university. And it was because they never met in the same place more than once because women weren't allowed to be educated. They weren't allowed to have a higher education. So these women sort of found this underground university where they would just, you know, go to people's homes and they would move locations and they would teach each other. Um, and so that plays a, a role. I fictionalize it a little bit in, in the fictional Maria story, because I was really fascinated with that too. And I, I think what really drew me to the story was thinking about what life was like for women at the time. And the fact that even when women didn't have opportunity, you know, these women found opportunity and made sure they had opportunity. And that was really inspiring, I think. Um, 
yeah, but I, I was really drawn to that as well. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I felt the Polish parts, I've never been to Poland and the Polish parts really came alive to me. They were very, very rich in detail, I felt, and I could feel the oppression from, you know, what was happening with the state, Russia, Russian rule and the lack of education for women and stuff. There was so much more freedom in Paris for yeah. Marie. And then in the, in the Maria part, you have it's her sisters who are successful in yeah. Paris. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I got a residency in the Centre Culturel in Paris, which is a, it's an Irish institution in Paris. And I finished my writing my novel there. And it was literally around the corner from the Marie Curie Museum. So I went there um, and it was fascinating. Her lab obviously is sealed off because it's dangerous, you know, yeah. but yeah. you can look in through the plate glass at her lab and you can see her clothing. There's, you know, there's a like a a mannequin with clothing on it that belonged to Marie. So it's, it's really fascinating. So I could really sort of see the ground she walked and when she talked about being obsessed with her lab, I, I knew where she was going. So that was really nice. That's amazing because I did not get to go there when I was writing the book. So <laughs> I, I really want to, but yeah, all of her, her papers are in lead lined boxes because they're still radioactive and will be for about another 1500 years, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, and one and one thing we sort of email about, about this a little bit that I was really fascinated by was the fact that both of our women were living in Paris at the same same time. You know, we're writing in the same time period in the same city, but their lives were so very different. Um, and so, like, maybe talk a little bit about. I'm fascinated by the fact that you finished writing the novel in Paris. So how did how did you use that to sort of um, draw out Nora's experience in Paris? I guess. Yeah, I when they got to Paris, it was just before Ulysses was published and that's when Joyce became famous. So that's uh, 1922. So they moved there, I think it was 1920, and they borrowed flats as usual. And then their affluence grew, mainly because Joyce found sponsors, wonderful women like Harriet Weaver and uh, Sylvia Beach, who sponsored him. And so suddenly they had more money. Nora loved style, Jim loved style as well. And so they began to dress really well. And then they began to eat in the, they always had high taste in terms of restaurants. So they would eat in beautiful places. So I basically spent my month, I would write every morning. And then in the afternoon, I went walking around Paris and they lived in areas near the Eiffel Tower, very residential. They were a family. So they had family needs as opposed to left bank needs. They were also a little bit older than the, um, the lost generation people. They were older and they had teenage children. And so they were more interested in kind of Jim doing his job, which was writing and Nora keeping house in a sense and socializing. Um, you know, she loved to throw tea parties and things like that. She loved to have people around and they always had a piano, no matter how poor they were, they hired a piano and they would sing together. So, yeah, I, I personally love to walk the ground of my novels. And so I make sure that I get to the places. So I went to Trieste and Zurich as well, where the Joyce's also lived. Uh, but the, the month at residency was a godsend, you know, I mean, that was, I was so pleased to get that because you're, you live in um, the left bank of Paris for a month in this beautiful old building. And, you know, you have your bed and your brekkie and then you just feed yourself and you get a small stipend. So, yeah, that was brilliant. The Joyce's lived at 19 addresses in Paris. So I was I did a lot of trotting around. <laughs> um, it was wonderful. I mean, Paris hasn't changed that much. It, it was designed, you know, essentially by Houseman, the boulevards. Yeah. And so it looks pretty much like it looked back then. Yeah. They're good That's preservation. Amazing. That must have been an amazing thing to do. Yeah, it was fantastic. It's funny, a year ago... Uh, over Christmas, right before the pandemic. Um, my wife and I went to London and Paris and we got some super cheap package because it was over the winter. And, uh, you know, of course I had to go to Shakespeare and company, mm -hmm. make a pilgrimage there. And, um, you know, where, where everything happened and just a fascinating place to be. It's yes. a, the shop is beautiful, but of course it's changed location. It was on a yeah. different street in Joyce's day, but right. yeah, and it, right. it's super busy now with its little cafe and stuff. But it is, it's a really, it's a really, it's every writer and book lover I know who goes to Paris makes a pilgrimage to Shakespeare. It's gorgeous, you know. Sure. Mm. I was going to ask you quickly, Nula, um, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, Richard Ellman and uh, the Maddox books. Have you read, uh, I mean, Edna O'Brien is such a hero 
Uh, have you read this small little, wonderful little book on James Joyce that she Oh, did? yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's terrific. It's beautiful. It's a lyrical sort of um, look at their relationship, that one. Oh, there's two. Yeah. She has one that's just about Nora and Jim, and she has one that's just about Jim. Yes, I have read them. I've read, like, I read as many of the biographies as I could stand to read <laughs> over the course of a few <laughs> years. So I read the main ones, um, and then I read... There's some obscure ones as well. Like there's a little biography of Nora that's based on the film that Ewan McGregor did and with Pat Murphy oh. and Jerry Stembridge. And then there's another Nora book written by a priest here in Galway. And, you know, everything you read will give you some other perspective, some different sort of angle to look at things. And then you go and make up your own mind anyway. You're designing people when you're writing biofiction in a sense, or you're breathing life into them um, and I suppose one place maybe that I diverged from other people was in terms of Nora and Lucia, because Nora has been demonized for not caring enough about Lucia. This has always been the narrative. And I refuse to believe that narrative as a mother. Um, I think she cared deeply for Lucia, but I think she was quicker to acknowledge than James Joyce that Lucia needed real help, like real, you know, she possibly needed to be institutionalized. Uh, earlier than she was um you know but it was actually Giorgio who first brought Lucia to an asylum but it doesn't suit the anti-Nora narrative to say that because you know it's easier to demonize her like she was told by the doctors to stay away at one point because she excited Lucia but you know when Giorgio and Joyce visited Lucia when she was incarcerated in Ivry you know, she jumped at them and tried to strangle them. So they excited her too, but you know, again, it doesn't suit the narrative. Um, I think a, James Joyce, they, they were a very tight family and there was an awful lot of love. But that would be fun. Them. Yeah. Can you um, see that? Yeah, some great pictures but, of the... You know, Joyce was determined almost to find a cure for Lucia that possibly could not be found, given that, you know, psychiatric treatments weren't terribly advanced there. Are they advanced now? You know, it's hard to say. Um, and it's hard to know if Lucia really did have schizophrenia. She had right. a lot of different issues. You know, some of it was like truancy. She would disappear for days on end. Some of it was violence. Some of it was a tendency towards, um, well, what would you say? She would go out without underwear and tell people she wasn't wearing underwear. She would go to pubs alone, which was unheard of for women. She, you know, would set fires in her bedroom, this kind of thing. So she had a lot of different things, mental problems going on. Isn't that your average teenager these days? <laughs> yeah. no, not mine. Mine are as quiet as mine. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Well, I was just going to ask, can you talk a little bit, uh, just for the people who are watching about, who may not be familiar, you know, with, with Nora Barnacle, um, you know, she comes from Galway, uh, and um, the way, the way you chose to, to tell the story, you know, as, as Jillian was saying, was, was much more of a, you know, linear progression in a way, but uh, can you kind of tell us where the book opens and, um, I thought it was really interesting, uh, you know, Joyce came from sort of, we talked about class and status at the beginning and she came from a, what would be considered a different class to Jim, correct? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, he was very much the artiste, but he, you know, from early on, you know, he, he said, uh, Nora, Nora, you are Ireland. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, the book opens in 1904 and it's uh, their fateful meeting in June in 1904. But Nora has recently, six months before she had left Galway, um, she had ran away basically because her uncle beat her for going out with a Protestant boy. She was a Catholic um, and she just wanted to get away from Galway. So she went to Dublin, quickly found work because she had been working for eight years already. It was normal in Ireland to leave school at the age of 12 right up until the 60s, unless your family had money, you left school at the age of 12. So Nora was educated to the age of 12, like most people. Joyce, on the other hand, came from a reasonably genteel, well-to-do family who were now fallen on hard times, basically because his father drank their money away. But so Joyce was educated. He went to Clongo's Wood and Belvedere College, which are two of the poshest boys schools in Ireland. And he also went to UCD and took a degree. And he also had studied in Paris for a while. 
So they were from educationally quite different backgrounds. Um, uh, Class-wise, Nora's father was a baker, but she was brought up by her granny because, again, a very common practice in Ireland to foster children out. Uh, Nora was sent to her granny around the age of five uh, because her mother had had twins. Her mother had eight children in total and eventually separated from her husband, actually quite early on separated. So there was a lot, they, but because Joyce's family had fallen on hard times, they both knew poverty, which actually helped them when they went away because often until, as I say, Ulysses made Joyce's name hugely, they had no money. So they knew how to get by on very little money. Though they were both quite profligate and Joyce was a great man for borrowing money from people that they would never see again. Um, you know, but they complemented each other. They were sort of, she was water to his fire. They were a great pairing, two Catholics, both very sensual, both loved style, both from port towns, you know, they got along. They loved singing, they loved words. Nora was a great storyteller. Like Joyce, when he saw her first, thought, wow, she's gorgeous. She had long auburn hair. Apparently she had a very erect carriage. She was very stylish and attractive. Um, and then as soon as she opened her mouth and her beautiful name, Nora Barnacle, he was obsessed with Ibsen, so the Nora alone would have snared him. But um, yeah, they, they, they hit it off straight away, even though ostensibly you could say they were very different. They had what each other needed. They were very yin and yang. You know, she was very earthy, calm, generous, naturally optimistic. He was more of a warrior, more sensitive, less able for people. He found people quite tricky, you know. Um, and obviously he drank a lot too, which she had to negotiate and deal with and scold him for. <laughs> <laughs> but she had one thing that comes across, and I'm sure Jillian, you'd agree, is that she has just unwavering faith in his talent and his in his genius. Um, I guess she only had to listen to him talk to know that he knew a lot and that he had great abilities. I mean, when you read Dubliners and realize it's the work of a man in his late teens, early 20s, it's astonishing, you know, he really was gifted. And he knew it, but that's OK. You can know it maybe if you're that gifted. They both had a natural confidence wherever they got it from. Each of them had a confidence in themselves that stood them well, you know, through all their endeavors. And I think that's nice. Maybe where they fell down was in their parenting style. It was a bit benign neglect. They, they uprooted the children so often the children had no roots. They were they were living between four or five different languages, you know, so uh, maybe their lifestyle was bad for the children. I don't like saying that because I don't like criticizing anybody for their parenting choices. It's a difficult thing to do. But, you know, Lucia and Giorgio, neither of them thrived. And you do have to look at that and question why. Well, you think of, you know, you think of like the, the hippie hippy dippy parents of, of, of our parents' generation, you know, and I'm sure we all know, we all had friends who, you know, whose parents lived in a commune somewhere, or that you know, was, no? <laughs> not well, not in, in Ireland, Ireland no. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, but, yeah. yeah, but not then, no. Yeah, but that, you know, that was born in 1969, so a lot of my, you know, friends when I was growing up seemed to have, at least there were a few, I'm not saying that I came from a, from a weird, commune or something but <laughs> there were always some flaky parents in the background that were real hippie type parents and um but they were bohemians i mean the joyces you know they were artists artists uh, well he was, she was yeah, yeah yeah i mean i don't i think they kind of um by the time they got to paris they sort of were they were more bourgeois really they were kind of looking down their nose at the bohemians at the Americans, they found them very loose with their morals. They still had a kind of a square Catholicism ethos that, that they couldn't get out from under. It's very difficult to get out from under that, you know, and they would look down their noses a bit at the, um, the carry on of the Hemingways and the, <laughs> the uh, you know, what's the name of the, the women, the rich women? Guggenheims. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. But one of the things, and then we'll, we'll go back to Jillian, but uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you was that there is this sort of 
the way that you told the story first person from Nora's perspective, I thought was was magical. Um, and you really get a sense of this kind of roguishness inside of her as well. You know, I mean, there's some very frank, uh, you know, sexual descriptions, as you say, they were both sensualists. Um, and I really enjoyed kind of getting a glimpse in, into her mind, uh, you know. Um, what do you think, Jillian? Do you, did you have that same reaction? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I felt like Nula's writing is so beautiful. It's like there was a poetry to it. Um, and then you also, you, you wrote a piece, I think it was in the Parish Review talking about, talking about the letters. I mean, I don't want to give any spoilers for the book, but I mean, I did get to the letters and then I actually did stop and like look up to see if they were, were real. I don't know if you want to talk about that or not, but your piece in the Parish Review is beautiful also if people want to want to read that too. Yeah, the letters are real. I mean, I had to rewrite, Nora's part of the correspondence is missing, but I had yeah, to Yeah, that's what I thought was fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I had to rewrite gyms because they're still in copyright and, uh, you know, I didn't want to get into copyright wrangles yeah. with actually with Stephen Joyce their last remaining direct descendant who was still alive he, he actually died in January 21 um so yeah I rewrote Jim's letters using very closely mimicking what he said um yeah very enjoyable I mean people know about the letters they're famous and so when they're there you can't ignore them and it was very yeah. important for me that they were in it because uh, Joyce and Nora had such a strong erotic bond you know especially early in their relationship you know it it bound them very tightly together at the start um yeah and her voice I mean that was the project the project was to bring Nora front and center and so it was never going to be anything but her voice and I love a first person voice or a second person voice that's where I'm most comfortable as a writer and I like to inhabit these characters you know almost to become them and I want the reader then that's my aim for the reader to inhabit the character and feel along with them. So I hope by doing that, that there's an atmosphere created whereby you begin to love Nora the way I love her, you know, and that you're carried along with her. One of the questions that's kind of come in, which is actually good for both of you is, um, uh, what was the most surprising thing that you found out uh, when you were researching your protagonists? I found so many surprising things. <laughs> um, you know, I think w one that is really interesting, I think, was about Marie's relationship with her daughters, the real Marie. Um, and one of the things that I love the best was that she she went back to work almost or back to the lab almost immediately after her oldest was born. And her father-in-law actually stayed at home with her daughter and then after the younger daughter was born he did too and if you think about that from our time that doesn't really seem like it's anything unique but to think about that in like 1905 where she went back to the lab and her her father-in-law who was who was a doctor he had retired at that point was the one sort of tasked with the child care I mean I loved that she pushed the boundary for the time and was able to do that um but I mean, gosh, there's so many surprising things about Marie Curie. Another one was that when she won her second Nobel Prize in 1911, she was actually going through this enormous personal scandal at the time that was playing out in the press, which I won't tell you what it is because it's in the book. But the Nobel Committee actually asked her not to come to Sweden to accept the prize because they were afraid of bad press. And she said no, and she went anyway. So I thought that was also really surprising and fascinating. But there's a lot and it's in the book. So I, I don't want to spoil them. <laughs> Such parallels with today, all of that thing about her being hounded by the newspaper. And, yeah. you know, she yeah. says to her daughter at one point, if I were a man, they would not be interested in my private life, you know? And I really felt. Right. Oh, mm. I know it's true. And it's still true. That, that, that's the thing. You know, it's interesting too, is that, um, you know, there's a lot, there's a riff in here, obviously, about, you know, the women in science. And mm -hmm. uh, even today, it's like, you know, my, my wife is a, a math and science teacher, and she studied physics, you know, at the local university. And, you know, she graduated 15 years ago or so. But she was like the token female 
-hmm. in the physics department, even now, you know? Yeah. And so one of the things that she tries to do, she teaches at a, oh, it's kind of an artsy fartsy uh, high school for kids. And so they're all, you know, they're all painters and artists and she's trying to teach them science. But, um, you know, she's really interested in trying to be a good role model for women, you know, young women to get into the sciences. You know, it, it's amazing how these attitudes still persist to this day. Yeah, I mean, I think that was also, when, when you look at what Marie struggled with and then to see that women are still struggling with that, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing to see how much she accomplished, but then, you know, also sad to see how little has changed. And she was the only woman in her chemistry and phys physics classes. She graduated at the top of her class, but she used to get mad because the men would talk about the fact that she had pretty hair and she didn't want anyone talking about her hair. She wanted people to be talking about science with her. Um, and she actually... Pierre had to propose to her three times before she said yes, even though she was in love with him. She didn't, she didn't want to get married. She had things she wanted to do. Um, she only agreed to marry him when he told her he would move to Poland with her and he would give up science and just teach French in Poland because uh, that was her plan. She wanted to move back to Poland. But then um, the job she thought she was going to get in Poland they wrote her a letter and said that they weren't going to hire her for it because she was a woman. So it was just sort of this like, you know, continual thing in her life. And, and she kept pushing back and she still was successful, which was amazing. Here's an interest, interesting idea. What happened? What if uh, Marie Curie meets James Joyce in Paris, marries Joyce and then <laughs> Nora marries uh, Pierre. <laughs> I was thinking about when I was reading Nora, I was like, what if they walked by each other on the street? I mean, they were they were in Paris at the, at the same time, living these very different lives, but they were both existing in the same city. And, and I did keep thinking about that, Nola. Well, absolutely. They would have known of each other because they were both famous. She for her Nobel Prize in scientific work and he for his writing. So they would definitely have known yeah. of each other and who each other were, which is kind of gorgeous when you think about it. I was, um, I, I really don't know anything about science. And I asked you when we were emailing about your relationship with science, because the radium and the, you know, it, it's kind of terrifying and luminous in your book. And I believed all of what you wrote about and everything. So can you talk a bit about your own relationship with science? Yeah, I know. And I'm, I'm, and thank you for saying that. I'm glad that you enjoyed that. Um, I really, I don't have a relationship with science. I mean, I had, I, I was sort of almost scared away from the book because I have to say chemistry was my least favorite subject in high school, but what brought me into it and made me feel I could do it was the fact that Marie's youngest daughter, Eve, um, became a writer and she wrote a biography about her mother and I read her biography first and so reading sort of her writer's perspective of her mother and her mother's science brought me it gave me a window into it that I could understand you know I'm not a scientist but she wasn't a scientist either but I, I was still able to understand the way she described it um, and that sort of made me feel like I could do it but I definitely I, I did have to go out of my comfort zone zone uh, to learn a little bit about the science. You know, that's not normally something I would do. And I realized I understood it more as an adult than I did in high school. I don't know, maybe I had a, just had a bad high school <laughs> chemistry experience. Um, but I, I was really drawn to it. And the idea of the radium, you know, at the time, nobody under understood it. You know, they didn't understand that it was dangerous. Pierre was sick for many years and nobody could figure out why he would go to doctor after doctor and Marie's older sister who who became a doctor would would suggest well maybe it's something in the lab and Marie was just adamant that it could not be the radium the radium was perfectly safe I mean you know at the time um they were putting radium in toothpaste because they they thought it was like amazing for you nobody really knew um so I was really drawn to that and fascinated by that and thinking about the fact that she discovered this. she had a radium tube on her nightstand that Pierre made for her that was just like a little a little nightlight. Um, 
I know. <laughs> I'm thinking about the fact that they had this and they don't, they didn't know about it, what we know today. And so I felt really drawn to write about that. You know, I'm, I, I was definitely nervous about writing about the science because it's not my area of specialty, but hopefully I pulled it off. And, and I also think very much, even though Marie was a scientist, I don't feel it's a book about science. I mean, there is some science in it, but I feel it's very much a book about, um, like, you know, being a woman and achieving in this male dominated world and being a mother and um, being a sister. And it's about class and gender and more than it is about science. Yeah. That makes sense. I loved that in it as well. And I love that Marie uh, is quite a spiky individual. You didn't try and fluffy her up for anybody. Yeah. And I think that's so important when you're writing people. We're all quite, you know, strange and spiky and we all have our weird little tendencies but yeah. you know there's a great quote from the Irish writer Anne Enright and she talks about how you know male characters if they're unpleasant you know that's fine that is the story whereas if women characters in a story are not likable so-called it makes the whole story unpleasant I'm paraphrasing um What's your thoughts, Gillian, on this business of likable so-called characters? And, you know, sometimes you get reviews and the, the, the reviewer clearly hasn't liked the character, but and, and that turns them off, if you know what I mean. Yeah. No, I mean, I, ha I, have, I have to say, I've all, I have already seen, <laughs> seen a review where somebody was like, Marie's not very likable. <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, what, what makes somebody likable? I think she, she had this amazing mind and she was very driven and she had good qualities and she had bad qualities. And I hope that I'm able to sort of get that across. And like you said, I think, I think we're all like that, you know, we're not, um, you know, we're not all perfect or, or all bad. And, and Marie, especially, I think does exhibit some sort of prickly, prickly qualities, but she sort of needed to, to, to get where she got. Um, but I know I do, I do think that there is sort of a tendency in fiction that women, women need to be likable, but I liked Marie a lot when I was writing her. I mean, and I liked her for her perseverance and for her drive. And did I always agree with all of her choices? You know, I didn't, but that made her really interesting to me. And it sort of gave me a window into her as a person. And, you know, I, I've been sort of like reluctant to talk about the, the tragedies that she faced because they're in their book and their, their plot points, but she did have this really tragic thing happen to her um, sort of at the height of her career. And the fact that she was able to overcome that and keep going, I mean, that made her extremely likable to me. So I don't know. I mean, what do you think about that? Because I, I think you could probably say the same, you know, the same thing for Nora. She, she have her, has her sort of like, you know, ups and downs as a, as a character as well. But I, I really, yes. And I, what I really enjoyed was that, um, you know, when Marie does suffer tragedies and it's not just her, her sisters as well go through yeah. terrible times, like really unfair tragedy. It's just like, yeah. oh, come on, you know. I know, I know. <laughs> um, and that at some point Marie just says, you know, I just want to give up. And I think we've all felt that sometimes when when bad news becomes relentless, it's extremely difficult to deal with. And I loved that you left her in there because I think it's important to leave these things to show that people are not and don't always have to be this tower of strength. Yes, she got through, but, you know, yeah, by some miracle she got through, you mm -hmm. know, um, and she did seem to have a good support system, which was excellent. Her sisters, you were excellent. Um, yes, I don't believe in, in um, making uh, super nice versions of my yeah. characters. I don't see any need for it. And like I often get, particularly from book bloggers, oh, I didn't like her, you know, about my characters. <laughs> but like I, I am personally an empath, so I tend to like flawed people, people who yeah. are struggling because I recognize so much of myself in them. Absolutely. And I, I really object to this business of readers wanting characters to be eternally lovable and making, you know, clever choices because none of us, literally none of us are like that. We all make horrible choices and horrible mistakes and do bad and wrong things. And it doesn't make us 
it's actually what makes us human. It doesn't make us less human, you know? And I just loved the humanity of your characters. Um, I absolutely fell in love with Pierre, you know, I just thought he was wonderful in both sections and, you know, yeah, I won't say anything more, but yeah, gosh, Pierre, loved him. <laughs> yeah, I did wants, too, I, I think to... I fell in love with him a little bit too. <laughs> <laughs> did you? <laughs> well, that's, uh, I mean, who wants to read about, you know, well-adjusted people making good, positive choices? <laughs> right. I mean, where's the, where's the, you know, where's the, the drama there. Yeah, um, exactly. Where's the push? Yeah. Well, Nula, as you know, since you're in Galway, um, were you, is, are there any descendants of the Barnacles uh, or Norris family anyway, still in that area? There are for sure. I haven't even tried to connect into them. I, you know, there's a certain audacity in taking on characters like James Joyce and Nora Barnacle and Marie Curie. And I think, and Emily Dickinson, who I've written about, and presumably um, <clears throat> Margot Frank, mm -hmm. you're taking on people who have attained a certain level of iconic status. And, you know, historians particularly shudder and academics definitely shudder when they hear what you're doing but you as the writer have to put all of that aside very quickly and I think for me the time when I put that aside is when I just I have the fear I have the oh god they're going to slaughter me now for tackling Joyce and then once I'm sort of maybe three days into the research, I forget all about the audacity and the largeness of the fame and the what are they going to say? And I just, and I forget about the family crucially and I just go for it. Because if you kept academics on this shoulder and family on that shoulder and you know, whoever on your other, you know, you'd never write what you want to write. And like, <clears throat> I don't know if you're the same Gillian, but my subjects really have to interest me. I really have to yeah. be, in love or falling in love to bother spending one or two years with them because it's it's a large commitment and it's not just one or two years it might take you one or two years to write the book then you might have one or two years of editing and preparing for publication so generally it's a long stretch of time you're going to be with these people talking about these people so you really have to have a lot of faith in what you're doing and a lot of love for the I mean, I hate calling them characters now because they're people. I tend to write about real people a lot. So for your people, you know, um, audacity be damned. We, we'll just do what we want to do because this is our business. Our business is fiction, not history. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And, and I definitely have to be in love with the people that I'm writing about to, to stick with it. And I think I do... I have that fear initially. It's like, oh my gosh, this is a real person. What am I doing? Then I write the book and I forget all about it. And then it comes back to me again when the book is done. I don't know if that if that returns to you. Um, and I, yeah. <laughs> and I've written about real people a few times and every time I do it, I think I shouldn't do this. This is so stressful. <laughs> but then I, I, I come back to it again and again, because I also think you know, we, we are writing fiction. I'm very clearly saying I'm writing fiction. I'm not a historian, but I do think that there is just like a, a value to readers who come to fiction, who wouldn't come to nonfiction, sort of learning about these people in a different way and understanding their lives in a different way. And I like that as a reader. I love to read, um, you know, books like Nora that are biofiction. Um, and I will come to that in a novel in a way I won't in nonfiction. Me too. But isn't it funny, though, that people always want to quiz you about what's true and what's not true? I get these what's true and what's not true questions all the time. Yeah. And it's like, I have, I have a pretty extensive author's note in the back of my and you have an author's note in yours, too, um, for that reason. But I do get those questions a lot, too. Yeah, like, you feel like saying, well, I've given you a person with a whole personality. Go and Google the facts if you're that desperate for them, you know? Like after the Emily Dickinson book, loads of people wants to know, was she gay, you know? It's like, well, make up your own mind. Do some reading. But I also think it's a really big compliment when people ask you that because then you've piqued their interest. And I, I find when I'm reading a book and then I immediately Google when I'm finished, which I did with Nora, then that means that you've brought me into this world and I want to know more. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, <laughs> I do the exact same. I mean, but it's just, it's kind of curious that people want to pick through the scenes almost and, and ask, well, is that bit true? And is that bit true? And yeah. a lot of it is, is you just um, 
taking a tiny snippet that I sometimes forget was a real thing and then fleshing it out. Mm -hmm. Often my facts and my fiction blend. And when I go back to sort of research for these type of events, I go, oh, I'd forgotten that was a true thing. I thought I'd made that up, you know, yeah. because again, there's that long stretch of time of research, writing, and the whole thing becomes this kind of soup and you sort of feel like you've made all of the soup, but actually you haven't. Some yeah. of the ingredients belong to other people. But yeah, it's, it's, oh, it's just an incredibly enjoyable process. I have to say, I love the, um, the uncovering of facts that I can then fictionalize, particularly when they're juicy, you know? Yeah, I agree with is that. There, is there any, uh, are there any recordings of, uh, of Nora speaking that you're aware of? No. Um, and there's only really one of Joyce and it's him reading part of Ulysses. Uh, there may be yeah. one other. Um, and he has that, this yeah. very Yeatsian beating kind of posh, you know, almost Anglo-Irish voice in it, which I cannot believe is what he sounded like when he was sitting on the bed calling her over to him or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Who's seen? Yeah, I love their language that they had. Uh, for each other and the way they, the intimate way they spoke with each other. I thought that was really well done. Thank you. For both of you, just a quick question. Um, were there were there any uh, kind of novels that that approach similar themes of, of recreating lives that inspired you both? Um, well, I'm, I'm a sucker for these kind of books anyway. So like I've read, um I loved Mrs Hemingway uh, it was the four Hemingway wives you know I've read books I've read uh the lacuna by Barbara Kingsolver which was about Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera uh, right. I I yeah I would naturally be drawn towards these books anyway I've read Hilary Mantel obviously she's like my goddess heroine I love Hilary uh, I love everything she says about writing she's so wise and clever um yeah, they wouldn't have directly inspired this because I've been kind of doing this kind of work for the last, I suppose, eight years or something. But um, yeah, I, I am just generally drawn to these kinds of novels. So I'm, I'm always interested in them. And, you know, I didn't know a lot about Marie Curie and I was just, I loved reading Gillian's novel. I feel like I know her now and I care for her. You know, I feel sort of she's in my little cohort of cherished women now you know I always had good feelings towards her but now I kind of yeah. love her you know? and yeah. I think if we can do that with these women and make them as important as the men that they worked beside or lived beside well then we've done our job well yeah you put that perfectly uh you know I totally agree with that and and I'm sort of drawn to those books as a reader too I can't think of one that is like a sliding doors one like I did, but I am always sort of drawn to reading the what if books, either, you know, historical or contemporary. Um, I mean, I think the most recent book I read was Una Out of Order, which is nothing like this book, but it also sort of has a what if premise, like what if a woman lived her life out of order? Um, and I'm always sort of drawn to that what if and and I find myself gravitating to that as a reader as well that's brilliant because that's like an extra dimension to biofiction you know I've been writing these very straightforward ones almost afraid to deviate you know I think there's a lot of debate around biofiction and people have very set and very different ideas about what it is and what it should be and yeah. I think while we're fiction writers we can we can kind of you know do whatever it is that we feel like doing and yet I find myself still very wedded to facts and and chronology and you know you were talking about making your list of dates that was obviously because of your structure right but I was doing that too I yeah. had to make sure it was the right date you know yeah, sure. so I get very caught up maybe too caught up in the biography actually the one I'm writing now there isn't much of a paper trail about this woman and um, she's a She's a 18th century feisty Irish woman. And because the paper trail is scant and because the anything that I can find is so conflicting and so sort of almost silly, I feel much freer to invent. Yeah. <laughs> I say that and even still I'm not, I'm not veering too far. I need to kind of maybe free myself out a bit, you know, and and find a different way. Like just sometimes, I don't know, sometimes like I read um, 
I read a book about Emily Dickinson, for example, and I never read them before I've written my own or while I'm writing my own, I'll read right. them after. And in this one, for example, she was going to taverns at night. Now for me, knowing Emily as a person, I really firmly believe she would not have done that. So unless I did something like what you did and create an alternate life for the person, mm -hmm. I, f I wouldn't feel like I could do that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, that, and, and that's why I think sometimes not writing about a real person is freeing <laughs> because then you do have sort of this room to invent those little things yeah. that you want to invent. Well, my other two novels that are contemporary are basically versions of me. So <laughs> I'm still using real people. <laughs> so. um, we have just a comment from one of our readers that says, talking about uh, Marie, uh, Sally says, it appears her older daughter died of leukemia yeah. and, Mar and Marie died of a radium related disorder. Yet e Eve lived until 102. Yes, that's true. Um, Irene uh, died of leukemia and Marie died, I think, of aplastic anemia, both which were radiation connected. Eve, who never went to the lab, lived a very, very long life. Um, also, Irene won a Nobel Prize um, and I, Eve did not. Uh, she was the only one in the family that did not, but her husband won a Nobel Peace Prize. So I just, Damn. they always like to say that in, in all the biographies. Um, and yeah, Eve became, a, she was a concert pianist. Then she was a war correspondent during World War II. Then she became a writer. Uh, she married an American diplomat and moved to the U.S. Um, so she, her, her life really diverged. And her biography of her mother is fascinating. If anyone's interested in further reading about Marie, that was sort of my favorite research book that I read. Do you remember the title? I think it's just, I think it's called Madame Curie. Okay. And it's by Eve Curie. That should be easy to find. Um, what, what are you working on now, Jillian? You probably hate that question because your book comes out what, today. <laughs> no, no, I like that question because I can answer it this time. Um, I have actually another novel coming out in January of 2022, um, which is called Beautiful Little Fools. And it's a reimagining of the world of the Great Gatsby, but from the women's points of view. So it's, oh, sort, of, yes. it's sort of like a Gatsby meets Big Little Lies. We have Daisy and Jordan and Myrtle and Myrtle's sister, Catherine. Um, and there's a little mystery around Gatsby's death. Um, so that, that was sort of a, you know, it was a much different novel to write than Half-Life because I wasn't writing about real people, but I was sort of writing from a book that already exists. Um, so that was really, really fun. And kind of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Idea, yeah, you know, kind of in that vein. So that's going to be out in January 2022. Um, and it's even though it was different, I have to say, like, thematically, I still sort of stuck with the themes of like, you know, women's roles and um, sort of women pushing against boundaries. And so you see that throughout all of my writing, even though sometimes my my subjects and my time periods tend to vary. That sounds great. Well, maybe it sounds fantastic. Thank yeah. you. By, by then, you can have you come up here in person. I, I hope so. I think so. By January 2022, then yeah, hopefully. Now, Nula, when are you going to come out to the desert? God, hold me back. I'd love to be there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I love Gatsby. That sounds absolutely fascinating. What a brilliant idea. I'd love that to be communing with Gatsby for a couple of years would be such That's really fun. fun. Yeah. Um, Who's the character that you referenced that you're working on now? Ooh, I haven't said actually. I'm I'm still writing the novel, so I won't really be finished probably until the autumn. Will I say? I haven't said yet to anyone. Can it's actually a, about a it's about the huh? Give us a hint. Is it something <laughs> that, something that we might guess? Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'll just tell you. Why not? It's about the Irish pirate Anne Bonny. Oh. Yeah, so she was Irish and she went to, she migrated to the Carolinas and then she became a pirate in the Caribbean. So yeah, it's been really good fun to write. Wow. I'm really enjoying it. I'm dying to get back to it. Obviously I'm on the PR trail for Nora at the moment because um, Nora came out in the States in January, but it comes out here in Ireland. Uh, in April. So I'm just heading into a big PR thing at the moment. I'm doing a lot of stuff. So then I'll get back to the novel, please God, in May, maybe, and I'll finish it in the autumn. 
But yeah. the thing, she turns out to be, because, uh, you know, William Bonnie was uh, Billy the Kid's name. It'd be interesting if she was Billy the Kid's mother. <laughs> Well, um, she's probably the wrong era, but yeah. you know, they, she maybe she could have. Yeah, you know, there there are differing stories about whether she died young or not. You know, I don't really care. I'm not going to go to the end of her life. Yeah, I'm going to do her wild years as a pirate. So yeah, it's good fun. It's, but again, <laughs> like like you with the science, I know nothing about boats, so I'm desperately researching and trying to understand boats. And God, it's hard work. <laughs> you have to go to the Caribbean, right? Because you have to. I mean, you have to experience yes that's the plan but look covid is kind of making everything weird yeah. and strange so we'll see how are you doing with it in ireland uh we're under the tightest lockdown since christmas eve and sadly numbers are going back up because people are fed up and are disobeying the rules and so it's bad it's bad the kids are back at school now um but nothing else has opened you know we there's no clothing stores opened there's no bookstores opened there's just supermarkets open that's it really nothing no pubs. else no pubs no wow no not since well well i think they opened briefly last september but no basically haven't been open for a year is the vaccine rollout happening there yet yes it's slow it's slow, it's slow. Yeah. yeah well i was just noticing i don't know if you saw it jillian that the Joyce and Nora, that's a the really, blue painting. really pretty painting. Oh, I didn't notice what that was. It's then, John is that, Nolan. Is that yeah. Emily on your pillow? Yes. <laughs> You're very good. <laughs> Crikey. And then that's the flat, is that the Flatiron building? Yes. Oh my God. All right, let me see yeah, what you got on your book rack here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. We are, my, this is my TBR pile. It's disgraceful. It's just growing and growing. But because I'm doing research for a novel, yeah. I don't have time to read for pleasure. Yeah. All it, you know, I'm either reviewing a book or I'm researching. So the book pile is ludicrous, to be honest. Well, uh, you know, the cover of photos so it's just so very striking. Beautiful, and I yeah. didn't mean to impose my. Uh, my lovely uh, Joyce Images book, but what a fun thing to flip through. There's some great pictures of them both in here. Yeah, uh, they, they were uh, photographed by very good photographers, especially in Paris, you know? Right. I mean, obviously the candid shots are lovely, but the, the official portraits are beautiful as well. Yeah. Well, let's see, no, no other questions, um, but uh, boy, it sure has been a, a fun to talk to you both. I appreciate so you nice. taking an hour really to talk fun. to Thank us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and just for everybody who's watching again, this is Nula O'Connor's brand new book, Nora. Um, and here is Jillian Cantor's new book, Half-Life. We've been talking about this last hour. And uh, you can buy them at your local independent bookstore, Poison Pen, ding, 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 or wherever they sell books. <laughs> um, but thanks so much again. And congratulations, both of you, Thank on you. publication.